I think we can start. I'm very happy to be moderating this women's panel on the meaning of the feminine in science and spirituality. And I'm grateful to Taya and Maurizio for giving me the chance. So I would like to start with very shortly introducing the wonderful women on my panel. Uh, here is Katerina Pepin. She's a theoretical physicist and she received a profound spiritual call in 2005 and has had a ver um, f various teachers. Uh, right now she's a student of Francis Messil. Uh, she just gave a presentation, so I'm very happy she could join us with our meeting. This is Galita Tassa. Galita is from Amsterdam. Uh, she is an artist and she's a voice expression uh, expert. Mm. She's mm. all about the feminine in voice and art and beauty. To my right is Ulmani. Uh, Ulmani is a non-duality teacher and she is also the author of two books, I Am Life Itself and Die to Love. So I'm really interested, especially in the last title. Um, <coughs> Malice Koshere, welcome. Uh, you are a satsang teacher, you are a counselor, and you're also an expert on sacred sexuality. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't have sound either, so I will pass you, okay. you to the mic. <laughs> we thought it would be nice to start this panel discussion with a short meditation that will probably help us anchor into the feminine already. So Galita will guide us through this uh, meditation. It will take about five minutes, more or less. You will do me to like this way, no? Huh? You will let me know when to stop. Sure, I will, uh, <laughs> yeah. <coughs> okay, so we will do it together. We will create together a connection to the feminine. We'll do it with voice. So the first thing I would like you to do is to breathe with me, so we will synchronize ourselves. So we'll do one. <sighs> yes, so we bring it all down. Again. <sighs> You sound beautiful. <laughs> Third time. <sighs> Good. So I just want you to imagine that if you would lift your hands up, this point would be your point of entrance because we would like to take it up and to bring it down so we will be connected and earthy. We are in a conference. There's a lot of excitement and, and talk, and, and we want to connect for us all to talk about the feminine. So we will go down. So we will do this. We'll take a breath, and we will do... Good. We're already in beautiful harmony. Um, so the first thing we will want to do is we will set our intention. So our intention is that every one of us is connected, empowered, from here to the earth and back, and that we are connected to each other. That's the intention we set. The second thing, we set the visualization. So when you close your eyes, I want you to already to feel, see where your heart is. And in your mother language, you can see the word yes, ya, yeah, ken, on the heart. And from there, we're expanding. And the third thing is the voice, which we just touched. So we will do it together. Take another breath. And when the sound of ha is the sound of the heart, we'll do another clunk. <laughs> we keep it circulating. you repeat after me and we will play a little bit. So, we're expanding our heart, we are connecting from above, we are here, we're sharing. Ha-ya-yeh, ha 
Thank you, Galita Tassa, that was so joyful. <laughs> Feminine. I could feel my whole being start <laughs> to come alive, basically. So the topic of this panel discussion is, as I said, the significance of the feminine in science and spiritu spirituality. And we can state that, um, that, of course, feminine energy is an integral part of life, and as such, it penetrates the whole of creation but that in both the scientific tradition as well as the religious tradition, it has been forced to go underground, that it has not been given its rightful place. Of course, this is an assumption, so I'm also very curious to hear your own, voice, your own thoughts on this. Uh, if we look uh, at science, we can see that uh, many qualities of um, scientific materialism can be um, called masculine in the sense that it has a it's a logic based system um, it is often reductionist um, it also has had traditionally a very conquering model towards nature the scientific materialistic paradigm and if we look at religions at uh, dominant religions um, a lot of those religions they have a very let's say um, a little bit skeptical or careful attitude towards sensuality, emotionality, sexuality. These qualities have been seen as impure or as sin in the worst case. So today's topic is why has this happened? Um, and also like, has this happened? Is this true that this happened? And of course the first question then is, if we talk about masculine and feminine, what is actually exactly the, the feminine? So that's my um, starting question. What is the feminine? I would like to ask all the speakers today, all the women, to give their approach or their um, perspective on what the feminine constitutes. I would like to start with Marlies. Marlies, what do you feel and see as the feminine? Well, <clears throat> I could say many things. Where to start? For me, especially with your introduction about feminine and masculine, for me the feminine, I was walking around in the woods here uh, the other day and I was pondering that question for the 10 millionth time. So what is the feminine? And then for me, the feminine is the woods, is life, is the fullness of life, is the aliveness. She flows blood, heart, bones, the body, aliveness. So it's bringing the fullness of life into the flesh. So as to kind of compare it, we could say 
<clears throat> masculine, we could say, is the empty space. And the feminine brings life. She fills it up with life. And uh, also in the tantric traditions, they speak about Shiva is just a corpse without uh, Shakti. So Shakti is the sacred feminine. She comes in and brings life and um, the juice. And um, that's the short version of my answer. <laughs> Really, um, I would say that the feminine, well, really, I don't know what the feminine is. And I don't think anyone really does. If we're really honest, this is just another concept, that another way of dividing life that perhaps you could say is more of a masculine way of doing things. <laughs> if you were to use those words. But if we are using those words, and if we are dividing things up, which is what we're doing here, so let's play with these words. I would say that the feminine um, is really about the paradox. That who we really are is empty, is formless, and yet plays in this form, plays as everything, plays as life itself, in this wild, chaotic dance, however it is. Yeah. Thank you. Galita? Yeah. You're first. <laughs> yes. Um, for me, um, not femininity, but the female is, um, is the space of the nothingness, which, he, which we all freak out from. Uh, because we are in a world of matter, of action. I think you can see the feminine when you look at the masculine, so you can imagine what the opposite is. So if the masculine is the electric force that going forward, the motion, the performance, the, the day, uh, then, then femininity is the dark, is the not formed, unheard, unseen, so we can talk about the feminine only in masculine terms because it doesn't exist. It's like the oneness that it, when you start to look at it, it's like disappearing. So, so I think that the, when, when you try to find balance in yourself, you can see the feminine in relation to the male. So your outside part and your inside part. So for me, the female is this ungraspable. That's why I like quantum physics, not that I understand any of it. <laughs> but for the first time you go like, oh, somebody described this undescribable thing. And they can only say that we don't know it. We know the know. We appreciate the know. The knowing, the, the world that is visible. The world that's not visible, we're afraid of it. And we can feel sometimes when we enter into the underworld, which is the world of the feminine, and there's a lot of collective pain in there. So we don't. It's much easier to be on the seen world. So the unknown and where everything comes from is the female for me. Okay, my turn. Um, so I don't, I would say a bit like Omani that I don't really know how to define it precisely, but what is very clear is that we have um, uh, we have some harmony and bipolarity between the masculine and the feminine. And um, uh, this balance has been a bit broken. We could see it in the way uh, physics has been made. And uh, so the balance between masculine and feminine has, has been a bit broken by evolution. Although there were cycles, there were times where the feminine was most uh, prevalent. But I'm not so sure we reached uh, ever a time where it was really balanced uh, mm. between the two. Now to define which are masculine qualities and feminine qualities, uh, except that uh, feminine uh, bears the children and, and give life. <laughs> I don't know how to define uh, more precisely. It's difficult, I think, to put a 
pinpoint definition on 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 every every concept. For example, uh, when I started in physics, um, some of my collaborators, um, uh, Russian guys, used to tell me that sometimes I think like a man and sometimes I think like a woman. And I, I, it was very disturbing for me. I was like, I mean, truth is one, logic is one. If I'm right, I'm right. I, I'm not. Uh, it was like, yeah, when I was wrong, I was like a woman. <laughs> and, when I, <laughs> and when I was right, I was thinking like a man. So like logic was masculine. And so it was a very kind of... And, uh, but in a sense, I would say, paradoxically, there is a truth to it. Like, not that logic, but... Um, yeah, I would say that there is not only one way to think, and indeed, the, I think that my brain uh, is a bit different from, from the one of my colleagues. So in some domains, I have more difficulties, and, and some, it's more easy. I would say, if I would say very vaguely, I'm more intuitive, maybe. So my first, my first, uh, my first love with a physics problem is intuition. To, to do the equation, I do it because I had to pass the exam, but I don't really like it. Uh, well, I like it. I like it when it's beautiful at the end, so it's very aesthetized. But anyway, my main point is that some balance has been broken, but it's very difficult to say between what and what. And uh, it, to get some, some balance back, it would be really beautiful. I think it would be something, something really needed. Catherine, can you... Do you have ideas on why the balance has been broken and when that happened, more or less? Well, I think the the, the but, um, I have a very evolutionary view on that. So, balance was broken. Yeah, it's very very evolutionary theories that uh, we are defined by by the tools that we use. So, in agrarian societies, when when they use the little uh, I don't know in English the word the the, the little uh, spade. Yeah, to to to, to, dig. To, to dig the the earth that you had more like a, a woman type society. As soon as you 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 start to use these other instruments like the plow. the plow, then you, you went to masculine because there was miscarriage, and uh, then we had uh, all this explosion of modernity, uh, which of course was was a masculine input, and mm. and now we are coming to a tool. I think the next, if I may make my prediction. Uh, we went. We are going to a, a time where the tool is a brain. I don't say it's spirit, but it's opening on some spaces which are more subtle. And the brain is a very special tool because you, you take it with you to work. Uh, you don't need to stay in a place. Or so indeed, the society will evolve and and re-equilibrate. Hopefully, re-equilibrate towards the feminine and not go overly towards the feminine. Because when a society is is too much feminine, it's horrible. I mean, all these sacrifices, human sacrifice, it was uh, feminine societies. I mean, I believe this is established. When there was all this religion and blood, and, and the feminine can really, uh, can, if it's too much feminine, it doesn't look good as well. <laughs> I think I mean, so we have to be careful to, to maybe to have a re reach a real balance. Yeah, balance. So, I have another question for you. <laughs> Oh, because you're working in the field of quantum physics, quantum, yeah. Um, yeah, quantum physics, and this has been described as a slightly more feminine approach to physics than the old Newtonian model. Do you agree with that? I would agree to a certain extent. If again, it, for a scientist that I am, it's, it, I don't, I don't have a real definition of feminine and masculine, so it's difficult to to talk scientifically about it. But what I see is what was said by. Uh, by the three or even four of us uh, here is like, uh, I mean, the observer is part of the observed. There are interpretations, so uh, we go into a space. As soon as you start to interpret, you go into a space which is in interior, interior world. And um, the fact that there are the mystery enters, so all interpretations of quantum mechanics are equivalent. We don't know which one to choose. Uh, I mean, the mystery has been attributed to as a feminine quality, the, the space, the mystery, the paradox. All that is entering. It is entering brutally in a very masculine way. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still entering uh, our way of thinking. Uh, now, will it revolutionize science to the point that the scientific paradigm of materialism will be shifted? Shift 
to, I don't know. <laughs> this I don't know. I hope. I hope very much. I hope very much that we reach the point where we can really shift the paradigm in, the sci in science. But so far, it has not happened. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah. you. If we look at the, um, the spiritu spirituality side um, of the equation, I'd like to ask Umani uh, what your thoughts are on, uh, on this. If you observe uh, dominance of the masculine way of viewing things, in, in spiritual teachings or if you don't observe that at all and if I also would like to ask you how it was for yourself to um, find, develop yourself as a non-duality teacher as a woman um, this is a, an interesting question actually because um, Really, uh, I would say that um, the majority of teachers uh, that I've heard of, anyway, um, are, mas are, are, are men. There are some beautiful uh, female teachers as well, um, but they seem to be less well known and um, less uh, kind of, they, they don't tend to put themselves out there as much. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> um, for for me, um, I guess it was um, it was when I started uh, teaching. Um, I actually at the time, although my main teacher was a woman, um, Dolano. Um, when I first started teaching. Um, the teachers that were in my immediate uh, vicinity were all, all men. And, um, and so it was pretty terrifying considering I was starting to speak out. And um, I felt that I really had nothing to say. I, I didn't know anything um, that I could give anyone that, that, that anyone else didn't know already. Um, and so I found myself um, falling into uh, kind of copying the context of the men uh, because I didn't know what else to do. You know, um, it seemed um, safer that way to kind of uh, copy the format and to start like that. At least that would kind of hold this not knowing that was what I was expressing. The format was kind of safe. Um, and over the time, I've been teaching about almost 10 years now, and over this time, uh, the courage has grown to actually uh, create this more unique format, which perhaps you could say is more feminine, I don't know. It's however it is. Um, and less of kind of the relying on that um, more known, safe format. Um, and it's ever-evolving and ever-changing, and I still don't feel like I know anything that I am telling anyone. Um, and uh, I guess um, within in the non-duality of spirituality, there's a lot of words spoken, a lot of concepts, which are very beautiful. And often um, these words and concepts are heard just as that, as words and concepts. And perhaps we could say this is more of the masculine way if we are dividing things, which I, I recoil from a little bit, but okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, it seems to be um, a very common thing that we exchange words and concepts and it sounds clever and it sounds very non-dual, um, but it seems the real kind of recognition perhaps is more of a feminine 
receptivity uh, uh, and not knowing and not finding uh, and not holding on to a particular word or a particular concept. Um, seeing how the thinking will grasp hold of a, a word or a concept and then seeing, oh, there's actually nothing there. I don't actually know anything and losing it again and again. So, yeah, and, and this can be ever uh, uncomfortable and revealing. Um, but perhaps this is the, the feminine expression, the feminine dance um, of feeling that and exploring that physically um, in the world, in the in nature, in, in everything, seeing them, what is not separate. Um, yeah, in, the, in this dance of form, formless form. Yeah. Thank you, that was very beautiful um, explanation and I do recognize this, of course I recognize this clinging tendency of the mind and also an urge for me to feel to find safety in concepts or ideas instead of to truly surrender to an experience. So I would like to ask you also, what has helped you or which conditions, were there any conditions that have helped you to surrender more into the experience itself and to relax into life and to let go of the need to define and pinpoint and um, yeah, have uh, linifications, let's say. Really, I feel absolutely nothing has helped me. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, yeah, that free fall, not having anything to help me, and feeling the terror of that. <laughs> Isn't that life itself? I mean, yeah. knowing that there's nothing that can ever save you. I don't agree with that. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I know it's terrifying, and of course you can have all kinds of ideas about it. But really, anything that might help you would only be a temporary fix that can make you feel good for a while. But the reality is that nothing can save you. And so you may as well face that and feel that. And paradoxically, of course, that is the greatest saving. <laughs> um, but not in the way that you think. Not by clinging on to some practice or some hope that it'll all be okay, but really feeling the fear, feeling the not knowing, the not finding, the emptiness, the nothingness, the freedom in that. And in my own experience, feeling that has been terrifying and has been everything. It includes the whole range of whatever life brings. But knowing that there's no escape from it, knowing that there is no hope of being saved, is such a relief. Because any hope <laughs> Any hope Ooh. seems to just um, provoke more uh, waiting, hoping, dreaming, longing. And this is endless. So, yeah, so in my own experience, feeling that and facing, let's say, the dark side, as you, you spoke of the underworld or 
the fear or whatever we normally consider is the that that unknown that dark side feeling that um without in um and and acknowledging that that it is it has just as much place here as any happiness and joy and peace and sweetness and all of the other side there's a there's a courage that grows in that there's a courage to live as that freely to express to dance to sing to um wildly express the chaos that is life and that seems to happen by itself so in my own experience i haven't needed anything to help me um and yet of course life itself has helped me in each moment so yeah yeah um <coughs> um of course you, we cannot really talk about it and here we're talking about it uh for me there's a lot that um i was kind of pondering when i was sitting here a little longer like <laughs> what are we talking about really and in my experience uh for me practice was very important very very important to truly find out who i am first of all and that's just a little belief but then you know okay i am this love that's great then to really own that live as that stand as that that to me is the feminine and that's bringing the deep dark into life and that takes practice you can say life that's life itself but man that takes practice practice and that's a big mess often and often we portray as teachers or you know how wonderful it's all one and it's empty and stuff but man it's full with shit too and it hurts and it's painful and it's a really has been for me an incredible learning to fully absolutely totally receive presence as it arrives in this body and then embody this and the moment presence arrives in this body it meets anything that's not free and that means mostly it meets pain and especially in i happen to for some reason work a lot with females and i happen to be a female in the female form <laughs> and and there's a lot of pain in uh, female forms I'm not saying there's no pain in male forms but I'm just kind of doing black and white here a little bit there's a deep deep pain in the feminine and in the female and uh that needs to be met and for that to be met and we fully absolutely need to receive that taste that because the moment it's absolutely tasted then form and formlessness can come together as one in the body and can live so it's not then I'm waking up here to my mind that's wonderful it's very spacious but then I'm waking up into my skin into my womb into my belly into my heart into my every cell in my body and my bones so I can live as that true love and you can put feminine to that you can put masculine to that does really matter but for me that was the biggest challenge to not be busy with feeling good and to really be busy with saying totally yes to life letting that take me enter me and that's an, a total surrender what's death for me uh, it's a great death painful but wonderfully painful so as practice <laughs> <laughs> life Galita, what is your own experience with um reconnecting to your feminine power and did you find some practical tools Yes, I did. You did. So tell us about your experience. Uh okay, I uh I, I, I everything I'm going to say or present now and everything I do as an artist, I bring from the feminine and I bring into a form which is the masculine and this is the completion. And I find this the only way to live fully happy uh, and i found it when i had a big crisis when my whole system collapsed 
and I shut everything down, and I thought, if I will close everything off, I will surely die, like the song. I didn't see anybody for two years, and I really, really thought, if I'll go into this, what's now I call the underworld, I will die in peace and uh, evaporate. But it didn't happen. What happened is that I found out stuff I didn't know I had in my system. First, it was um, pain, the collective pain. And when I was looking where it comes from, I went into my family, my family line, my women in my family, and I, was, I didn't know where I got to, but it was adventurous. And from that, I, started, I wrote a book, and then I started to write music, and form came. In the end of the two years, I saw I didn't die, but I found something which I didn't know how to handle. And I still now, I, the balance of how to handle, I think it's the issues of all of us. I think evolution happened by we starting to do that with ourselves, with our outside world, inside world, our ego world, our soul world, and our brain left and right. And I solely believe that this is, this is the work. Uh, so what helped me practice is definitely the only way to bring it into form, because our, our brain is not, it's changing all the time. So it's something that you have to anchor per day. Um, uh, I do it through voice. I find that for me, voice is everything. Uh, not only the physical voice. I made a, a roadmap that's called your, Use Your Voices, and it is a, your physical voice, which is like where you breathe, where you talk, but also your mental voices that will say to you, I cannot, I cannot, you know, all this programming. A connection to the inner voice, which is the connection to the total thing. And so when you said nothing helped you, I thought, how is that possible? Everything is helping, actually. If you can, if you, but from the other hand, it's true that there is a total uh, surrender to the nothingness. And the, but the surrender is the one that's helping you. Yes, so that's, so that's yeah, true, but... Uh, we agree. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so the fourth wo voices will be the emotional voice, and I noticed that in order to have a total cycle of total balance between all of those things, I just wear in a neck necklace of this eternity thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this was you right brain, left brain, outside, inside, is, wow. is, is that you use your total self. So that's what helped me, and uh, it, uh, it uh, yeah, brought me from the dead, <laughs> I would say, and expanded my life, and I really, I wish it on everybody to see that it is just about possible. We have it in, a, in our system, in our body, and in our brain, in our spirit, and it's just huge and very rich. So, but I have to say that the feminine is really, really can scare you, because if you come to touch into this collective femaleness, which we all feel as men and women on this planet, it's too big and it's too much, and I realize that it's not my responsibility to heal the whole thing. Nobody can do that. I can just do myself at the moment, how I, bring it to my daughter, how I don't pass out things that had to be digested two generations ago, and that's it. And from that you expand your happiness, and then, then it's working, and it's also much more joyful. Mm. So, uh, so this femaleness that looked you know, like, a, for me, in a visualization, it looked like a mouth, like you're under the sea, and you come into a mouth of a really big wall fish, and you go like, oh my God, it's gonna swallow me up. But after they swallow you up, you come out again. So, <laughs> so, I, so I'm not afraid anymore. I, I like that. Th right, I so love that image. Yes. Ah. <laughs> Katerina, I saw you smile when um, Galita talked about the joy, joyfulness. Um, can you tell something about what's joy for you and if it relates to the feminine and intuition? Oh, uh, about joy and happiness for me, it's much more than the feminine. I think it's uh, just all my spiritual quest is based on that. Um, it's feminine and masculine. I mean, th there are there are some qualities like uh, truth, joy, beauty, which are not feminine or masculine. I think this is a very big mistake to attribute to one or another. And I would like to give an example uh, that we in science, we know that. Uh, uh, when well, science has been, like modern science as we know it, has been made by men. That's a fact. So we can scientifically say that if women start to think about it, it will change. <laughs> we don't know whether it will be better or not better, but it will change for sure. Uh, but something we know is uh, like men can be good, very good, excellent, but the giants, almost with no exception, they, they had an incredible woman at their side. So. I can give you an example, uh, Blaise Pascal, this kind of universal genius of the 17th century. He was almost all his life in love with his sister, who was a genius too. She was Jacqueline Pascal, she was a poet. She, of course, she's not famous, he is famous, she's not famous. But 
like it was like for me one of the example like you believe it's kind of a twin souls like decide to get incarnate in the same family and they grew up together like these two geniuses and and that we know is plays a revolutionize uh, completely the I mean the way the way of thinking was part of this uh, uh, this uh, mod uh, uh, this modernity coming. And uh, we know that he, up until the end of his life, uh, so Jacqueline at the end uh, decided to go to, to the convent. And um, she even had this incredible sentence uh, to him, like, don't take away from me what you cannot offer to me, which <laughs> says a bit, I don't know whether you can translate that uh, better. Ne m'ôtez point ce que vous ne pouvez m'offrir. She had to do his brother. But what I mean is, up to the end of his life, Blaise was going uh, every two days at, at the convent to, to talk with her, to explain the physics theory he had. So you take Tesla, it would be the same with his mother. Uh, you would take Lavoisier, uh, he was guillotined at, uh, at the revolution, but his wife was an incredible uh, scientist. And even Einstein, like uh, he got married twice, and after his first marriage, he was 41, he divorced his first wife. He had this horrible sentence saying, like, um, my second wife doesn't know anything about physics. The first knew only too much. <laughs> but, but after 41, Einstein doesn't produce anything. Mm -hmm. And before the age of 41, he has completely revolutionized the science. So, of course, feminists said she did everything, and she is not well known. I don't think it's true. They did together. Maybe they came back home, they discussed. It's very, very mysterious, this synergy. There is, it looks like it's nothing, this, this symmetry, this synergy between masculine and feminine, but we have absolutely no clue what could emerge on that. And it's a scientific fact with almost no exception, like the giants. They had an extremely strong feminine figure. And I would like to, to talk about the, the power, the power of uh, the feminine. Uh, it's very powerful in a different way than the masculine is. And and when the two got together, you get the reaction at all levels. Uh. Thanks. Um, Marlies, I would ask, like to ask you something about sacred sexuality and also our relationship to the earth. Um, when I asked you what femininity meant to you, you started to talk about the woods and trees. So you made a reference to, to, to earth. Um, I think a lot of uh, women and maybe mankind in general has some obstacles when it comes to a natural free-flowing expression of sexuality. Uh, I wonder if um, you encounter this in your own practice, practice in your own work, and if you, see, uh, if you see a connection or relationship to our own attitude towards the natural world, when we talk about sexuality on the one hand and mm. our relationship to to Earth, on the other hand. Well, <clears throat> there seems to be a big disconnect with um, with Mother Earth, really. If you see the way we have treated her, um, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> and that's, in a way, also how we have treated our bodies. And for me, within when we bring that to spirituality, it mostly within spirituality, anything around the body, sensuality, sexuality has been cut out. And when obviously when something is being cut out, it just sneaks in anyways. That's very obvious about the misuse of sex and sexuality and sensuality. And um, I think the beauty of coming into the body, into the senses, is really arriving here. Mm. And the moment we <coughs> arrive here, then <coughs> we, you know, we arrive here in our bodies or we arrive here in nature. We just arrive here. And then we truly can make love with what is here. <coughs> but most of us, we're not, we haven't even arrived. And also... In, in lovemaking, when we actually, we need to be here, because the moment we're here, in, we're in the senses, we're in the sensational, we're kind of bringing form and formless together here in the senses, then we can really truly meet one another. 
And that takes time. It takes time to rest in ourselves first and taste that beauty that we are, taste and receive ourselves, that sensuality, the senses, the body, the flesh, as also nature, you know, it's just so alive. And that aliveness is right here too. And when that aliveness is being experienced and we bring that in contact with another, it's like really um, the body start melting. It's like almost, you could say, third energy starts happening. What is spirit itself? But it's really spirit then meeting spirit. Form, formless, meeting form, formless, and coming together as one. It's quite hard to talk about. Um, but it's really coming together as the one that we are in the body. So in my experience in working with men and women, it's, it's uh, men tend to be kind of more spacious, hang out more in space. Mm -hmm. And um, that's very beautiful. Women tend to be hang out a little bit more in their bodies. And <clears throat> I think for all of us, <clears throat> it's to learn to come together, to bring it together. So women tend to hold on a little bit here. Men tend to hold on a little bit here. And it's really kind of letting life come and go, let come into a natural flow within ourselves and in the meeting. And when that happens, it's like, you know, you, you don't know anymore who is what, who, who, who is male or female or form or formless. It doesn't matter anymore yeah, because everything moves as this one, uh, as this one life. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what Beautiful. came up. Um, just hearing you speak just reminded me of how um, I find it fascinating um, working with uh, men and women uh, in the meetings that I run or retreats. That um, Because I have uh, very intimate dialogues with, with people, and I find that for, um, for women... It's usually, I mean, obviously we're generalizing here, but usually women tend to doubt themselves. They doubt their knowing, their real knowing of who they are, life itself. They tend to fall into like, oh, I'm not, I'm not enough, I'm not good enough, I'm, the, you know, who am I to to know anything I couldn't possibly um, and so in in dialogues I will kind of encourage their real knowing like kind of big them up a bit you know whereas the, it's interesting it's the opposite with men usually <laughs> <laughs> they think they know usually <laughs> sorry men but um, they think they know a, um, a lot of words and concepts and it's, so it's what I do with them in, in an in a intimate dialogue is to kind of bring them down a peg or two and so that they see that actually they don't know. And it's really about that kind of, that balance. So um, any position that we take, whether it's, oh, I don't know, I, I couldn't possibly, you know, it's not me, or, or I know, both are posi positions um, and neither are true. So that's the same for any time, any time we kind of take a position in the feminine or a position in the masculine. Both are positions in, in thinking, actually. <coughs> and the reality is the balance that can cancels all positions out. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> zero. One is... Yeah, same, same. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Umani. Well, we're almost um, nearing the end of this panel discussion, but I would like to give you the opportunity to ask a question to one of the panel members. So is there anyone who has a question? Burning question. I see a hand there. I think we have a mic for the audience members. I, I talk really loudly. Okay. <laughs> I was interested in what Katarina was talking about, tools. And that's something that fascinates me. I'm getting involved in electronic music, so I'm working with a lot of tools developed by men, which I see they <coughs> don't fit, like, yeah, polyrhythmicity, organic forms, and so forth, are very hard to fit in within certain digital audio workplaces and so forth. 
So, um, so I think, oh, I'm thinking differently and I need a different tool, which you can find. So I was wondering if you, and I find collaboration then so exquisite because the um, wonderful male qualities can also <coughs> be brought into maybe more, again, a, avoiding essentialism, female ways of thinking. So I was wondering about collaborations of you with men and um, to create tooling or to create different ways of languages or expression or artistic <coughs> expression or scientific expression. Is this clear enough? Question? Yeah, it's yeah. a very vast question. And I must tell you that I, I just like to, to bring a little personal anecdote. When I, I started my my career in physics, I was uh, exactly like what well, like was described here. I was not very secure. And um, I was always choosing collaborators, which I found were not, not so good. So I was at least as good as them. It's what I was thinking. So of course, it was a recipe for disaster. <laughs> because... Uh, then all this kind of problem between the masculine and feminine were entering into play. Like in science, you are on the blackboard, and if you make a mistake, your collaborator will see it. Most hopefully, hopefully. But you know, it's black and white in terms of little mistakes we can make. And if you are much, much stronger than your collaborator, uh, if it was a young man of my age in front, usually it was very difficult to reach anything creative. And then I reached a point where I wanted to leave, and then I decided, okay, maybe I should choose the opposite strategy. So I, I decided to work with guys that were like, I, I found themselves two orders of magnitude better than me. And then it was a miracle. It was working perfectly well. I, I seemed to bring uh, something that they didn't have, and uh, I could be completely myself. They were not intimidated. So I don't tell you it's optimal, um, but what I know out of that, it is really worth by any means to try any collaboration between men and women at the level of creativity. Because even us now with my collaborators, we don't have no clue uh, what will come out of it. No clue. It is something very, very surprising, very mysterious. And the fact that I could work much better with men that were obviously uh, stronger than me in terms of this masculine classification, like. Look, no, I, it has to be a fact, like in terms of masculine classification, women in physics are good, very good, but we still have very, very few examples of huge success. Like uh, we had one in France, Marie Curie and Irene, and this <coughs> was very uh, influential on, on a bringing of women. So we need more huge success, but maybe it will be difficult to get them in the actual science, uh, which has a masculine way of, uh, of putting hierarchy. Uh, but in any case, uh, I, I just bring you like it was. It's not perfect. I think it would be much perfect world if I, I could work with uh, very very easily uh, with uh, men of my uh, equals, more equals than me. So with younger boys, it works well. But I'm very maternal. As <laughs> there is something else. Yes. Like, look, it, it's very surprising, like, the ways of, of the law. Like, my actual collaborator is a Soviet scientist, so it's, it's the one telling me you think like a man or a woman. So you could say, like, go away, like, but it's working well. And he uh, also thinks it's working well. Well, sure, you can see the result. It's the best thing he did his in career. But if you had asked to... to <laughs> you know, no, but if you had to ask him before... I think he, he was working with me because for him it was it was the first time he was working with a woman and and those Russians they have this weird kind of uh, way of so it's very beautiful <laughs> collaboration but but the point is for him it was a surprise like it was like oh, look like what we got you know <laughs> so it's like so it's worth by any means it's worth to try to to equilibrate but it can take some ways which are very surprising. Uh, it's not perfect for sure. At least that's my experience. Uh, yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for. I, I think we have time for one more question before we go to the break. So who would like to ask the last question? Burning question. Can no. I? Yeah. Of course. Yes. I. I don't have a question. I mean, I have a lot of questions, but I love to be in the question really. <laughs> I'd like to add something. Is it possible? Sure. Yeah. Please. I'd like to add something. Jesus, what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, as you were talking about the femi feminine and um, about um, 
not knowing really what it is. Um, I like that. I like being lost. And what you were speaking about, I hear, heard the word dance a lot of times and being here. And now uh, I'm going to dance this afternoon. And I want to invite you to just join and let's dance. Let's be in this body and explore and fall into the nothingness and be in the body and just move this energy. I, I'm really fascinated by the words, but, but my body just wants to move it. <laughs> you know, not with the words, but just want to move it and just, great, great. you know, nice. like that. So that's what I want to add as a, a woman, just to come and join <laughs> five nice. rhythm dance born out of a woman and intuition. I'm all shaky, but I really love to dance with you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, sharing. Well, I want to thank you all very much for coming to this discussion. I really enjoyed it. Of course, thank you Marlies, Galita, Umani, I'm Mar um, sorry, <laughs> Catherine, <laughs> Galita, Umani, Marlies. Um, thank you too. Thank you, thank you. Thank you're, thank welcome. you for organizing. you're welcome. Um, yeah. I wish you a great day today and um, have, a, have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.